So welcome to this week's Escape the Limits podcast. This is a different podcast from normal. This is the end of the year podcast. And uh, last year I decided to do a bit of a summary on what I'd learned from the guests and from doing this for 12 months. And, and this year I thought it'd be a good idea to do it again, but slightly different. And the, the person who's behind the camera, who's not normally seen, who arranges and organizes a lot of it in, in most cases is Mr. Kevin Lee. Now I see how, how weird it is to have all these cameras in front of you and this big old light and the, all the audio. It, it's quite overwhelming. <laughs> I didn't realize how overwhelming this was. So a lot of props to you for being such a pro in front of the cameras. Yeah, and, and, <laughs> and the first ones, I was nervous about just doing it. And in the first 12 months, I guess, and in the second 12 months, you're actually nervous because now you know a lot of people are listening to it and, and you, 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 I guess the game is raised because there's more expectations, I suppose. So yeah. the nerves never go away from my side. No, but you know, I'm going to call you out because I, I have to have you share what you've kind of, what people have said in the comments in a lot of the YouTube videos and stuff. Who are the celebrities that people recognize you as? Yeah, I, I, I must admit, I, I do get... Uh, mistaken for Lance Armstrong. No idea why, but it... <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't see the resemblance, not at all. You know, I've seen I've seen comments that people say you look like Bruce Willis. <laughs> so from all the Die Hard movies, I'm like yeah, I see that. So so people are like, uh, I didn't re I didn't realize Lance Armstrong hosted this show or Bruce Willis hosted this show. So when I see those comments, I giggle a little bit because I'm like, yeah, he really does look like those people. So that's awesome. I'm not sure whether that's a good thing or bad thing, I think but it's a I'll, great I'll thing. take it. I, I think it's a great <laughs> thing. Like, don't you get pulled over at restaurants and stuff? Or <laughs> Not that famous yet, Kevin. <laughs> if I do, I, I will use it. <laughs> I just be like, yeah, yeah. I use it to get a good table. Yeah, a table for two right there. A lot has happened. It, just from being on the other side of the camera, you've, you've seen a lot of guests. You've traveled all over. And I think the feedback for the show has been pretty unanimous it's it's great you've been you've you've really touched on a lot of subjects and really impacted a lot of people in the industry um and if and a lot a few key concepts or or topics have come up quite a bit um why don't we talk about those first what would you say are the three key topics that really came up over this last year for you well i think one of the things that started to I guess unfold as we got into them was 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 two ends two total ends of the spectrum. Uh, one of the one of the subjects that was spoken about a lot was within I guess the what what you would call the traditional fitness industry is is the fact that it's becoming very competitive. So I suppose in a lot of markets around the world, if you have some sort of fitness business, then there's a lot more people moving into the space. So, so you, you have either the boutiques moving into the space which are competing with the traditional clubs and you have a proliferation of boutiques competing against each other because I guess it's a lot lower barrier to entry. On the supplier side, same sort of thing happening. So, so I guess on one side, there's a lot of the conversation seems to be about how competitive it is how much pressure there is on on pricing and and the fact that it's it's uh, I guess referring to the book is that there's a, a kind of red ocean where everybody's fighting for the same customer and and not making any money and it's a bit of a bloody battle. On the opposite side, we've uh, collectively searched out to find a lot of different people in different spaces that wouldn't be classed as the traditional fitness industry. So you, you probably wouldn't see a lot of these people if you go to Ursa or one of these traditional fitness shows. And, and there seems to be a, a, a huge amount of these new and different business models that are not traditional, but that are popping up all over the place and thriving and, and not necessarily just, just creating more of the same, but, but actually developing a lot of new categories. So I, I guess for our business that's been around for for just over 20 years now, sort of sitting in the middle, supplying sort of both both customers. It's an interesting time because, uh, you know, one of the observations is, yes, it's pretty tough and competitive out there. And that you could look at that and say, well, that's a picture of, of, of 
the market that we're dealing in. But then you look at the other side and you see all this opportunity and possibility and almost infinite. So I guess one of the takeaways is I've, I've seen both and, and what I've tried to do or what our team have tried to do is to highlight that it's not all doom and gloom and there are a lot of opportunities. It's just a case of rethinking and relooking and, and, and trying to identify what those opportunities are that you could go after. Absolutely. So in terms of the blue ocean and the red ocean concept, what movements are you seeing that are really a good example of the blue ocean strategy? Okay. Well, one of the things that we're seeing a lot of is people that we've interviewed. I'll, I'll, I'll pick one of our guests, um, which would be Cali Muscle, for example. So you wouldn't probably think of him as being a competition to any kind of traditional fitness concept. And yet this guy's got a huge online business where he's training people that are interested in building muscle, working out at home, getting workout programs. And, and he's created a very, very successful business of content and nutrition that would arguably be competing for the same person that may go into a traditional fitness club. Now, I don't know whether any of that is, is true or not, or I don't know whether people still go to a fitness club and follow his programs and do it inside the gym. But I guess Cali is an example of, of having a huge community, millions of followers, uh, a, a very good business, a training business where he's actually training people on how to build muscle, for example. And, and yet it's, it's something that probably you, you don't hear about when you go to a lot of traditional fitness shows. So, so I think there's a lot of versions of Cali that whether they, they, they have products or digital services that they're selling on Instagram or YouTube or anywhere like that, this whole online training business that, that I think a lot of traditional businesses have, have, have probably overlooked. So I think that's, that's, that's probably the first one. The other one in terms of categories, which again, certainly a lot of people that we talk, talk about have, have not necessarily included this as part of their future plans in, in most cases. But one, one, of the, one of the interesting areas I'm seeing talked about a lot is, is this recovery. Yeah. Um, you know, it's, it's, it's very obvious when you start to speak to people about it, but if most of the conversation around working out is that you need to do it on a regular basis and you need to do it hard and you need to be effective, it's, it's all about the activity that you do. And are you working hard enough and are you putting enough in? In a lot of cases, people are probably taking that to the extreme and, and they are doing that, but they're not necessarily getting the results that they want. And so I think one of the interesting concepts is balancing that sort of work hard, play hard concept with making sure that you're recovering enough so that you can do that. And, and that's something that you probably, ha I, I certainly haven't seen it a lot in traditional fitness businesses or gyms, but I can certainly see locations and places opening up where you will see maybe a recovery place next door. Uh, if you look at something like Stretch Labs, for example, I think they're one of the, the sort of early brands or chains out there that are starting to create that as a, as a concept. And, and my guess is that there's, there's a huge opportunity to give people a structured recovery or flexibility or, or rejuvenation program that's aligned to a hit studio or hit concept where you know, huge opportunity, nobody's doing it, complete white space, but, but it's, it's still something that nobody's really looking at necessarily you know, in a, on a wide scale basis at the moment. Now that I think about it, with, the, with CrossFit, with all these boot camps, fairies, uh, orange theories, uh, F45s, they really do focus on just the workouts. But very few facilities or spaces are on the wellness side where they're doing recovery, they're doing post-workout treatments, where they're doing cryo, they're, they're not really taking advantage of that stuff, but the spaces that are, they're in a completely brand new niche that's not really touched on yet. Yeah. And I think uh, in the next you know, three to five years, we could probably see a massive growth in those. Yeah. Now, in terms of the blue ocean, red ocean, do you think that the, that the recovery space could be lumped in with the red ocean? In, in, in what, what respect? In, in like, you know, be lumped in with the big boxes, the boutiques. Right, okay, I'm with you, yeah. Well, I, I think if you, one of the things that uh, Brian O'Rourke spoke about, we interviewed him recently, was this share of wallet 
Um, we also had a guest on a few weeks ago that was talking about the nightclub industry and, and how much they spend in, in the whole going out experience and taxis and restaurants. So a lot of, everyone's got a, a lot of people that tend to go out and socialize. There's a certain amount of money that they have for, le for leisure. And, and so I, I think it's, it's just make, you know, thinking about how you can optimize what's, what's available. And, and so to answer your question, I, I think that certainly there's, there's some work being required to explain to people the importance of that recovery. But I think it's probably an easier sell to say, come here, relax and stretch and, and just de-stress as, as opposed to come here and work out and it's going to be hurt and it's going to be painful. So, so I think there's a great opportunity to, to probably, and, 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 it's, and it associates, it, it links very closely to the workout. So I think there's an opportunity to generate additional revenue from the customers that are already going to those facilities. I, I think it's just a, an education there's a lot of education required to, to get people to understand the need to do it and to, and to be able to pay for the benefits of that. Yeah. Now, outside of the, the, the actual facilities, are you seeing, have you seen anything that, that kind of fits into that recovery space without actually having to be a facility? I've seen gyms and wellness spaces that promote using the Theragun. Like they literally charge like 25 bucks for a 15 minute service of just getting worked on with the Theragun. Yeah. Yeah. I've seen uh, UFC gyms, for example, I think they've got that, that it's something that they're doing and they have inside their clubs. I've seen Equinox also do that. And, and I, I think it's about making it easy. So one of the benefits about Theragun compared to foam rolling, foam rolling takes time. It's not easy to do. It's, it, it's, although it's important, it's not convenient. I struggle to, to make time to do it because I think we're all short of time. Whereas going up, you know, zipping up and down or having someone zip up and down with a couple of Theraguns is, is great. I, I think being able to, if, if you look at uh, Jason from Theragun, they've actually got a, uh, a, small, uh, um, a small studio in, uh, in Westfield where you can actually go in there and you can have a five or 10 minute session nice. where they'll just actually sort of, I don't know what, I don't know what they call it, but they'll, I'll just kind of massage you with, with the guns and it's very quick, you, you get in and out. So, so I think it's, it's about how to, how to package that and make it easy and convenient and, and, and you'll be able to, to charge for that. But yeah, I, I certainly think Theragun are a great example of a company that's doing that. Um, and and, and there's, there's others out there, uh, um, which uh, hopefully we can, we can get on the podcast. Yeah, so outside of, so we have, we have, Recovery spaces like uh, Stretch Lab. We have Rich Richie's in New York. What did he call that? Uh, Recover. Recover. Yeah. Where they have pods and all sorts of other devices that aren't normally in the, the fitness and wellness space, but they, they use those for rapid recovery. Yeah. Do you think you'll see more facilities like that? Yeah, yeah, certainly, and we, we, I believe we've got someone on in a few weeks that's got a, a, a personal training studio and recover studio combined together. I think that uh, one of the things that uh, Rich Richie's got is the sleep new calm, so you can go in there and kind of have a power nap, and it's you, in within ten to fifteen minutes, it's the equivalent of having about two or three hours sleep. So I think that's important, and and I think the reason that those things are becoming more important is, is that it's not just the link to exercise, but the link to stress. And certainly a lot of people that we talk about that are running in, in businesses, running businesses, it's, it's, it becomes very stressful. You're constantly turned on. People's hours of work merge into their personal life. So you're always switched on. There's always emails coming through. There's social media. There, you're always on as opposed to, uh, I think Dennis Hughes says this, the younger people, it, they, they used to be always on, whereas I think probably my generation and older, you would kind of have your times when you're on and off, if that makes sense. Yeah. So you'd, you'd have your work hours and then you'd be off. And when you're off, that's it. I, I think now, now, nowadays people share all of their lives. So whether it's Instagram stories or Snapchat or whatever, their whole life is, is being is you're on camera, you're, you're, you're communicating things. So you never actually got that downtime. You, you, you never 
shut yourself away and, and thinking. And, and I think that's, that's important. If you listen to people like Paul Cech, uh, he, he talks about the, the importance of getting in touch with yourself, uh, being able to sort of use your own, um, make your own decisions about what's right. But I think if you're always on, if you're always connected, then it's very difficult to it's, it's very difficult to separate yourself from the decision making process, and particularly if you're if you're starting to get tired or run down, whether that's through working out or just working, and and the the quality of your decisions is can be compromised, and and, and if you're responsible for a lot of people, whether that's you're a manager or a company owner or department leader or what have you, you're you want to be, I guess rested, level-minded, and, and able to make good decisions. And so I think this, this recovery, yes, it links into uh, just recovering your body from a great workout, but I think also it's, it's recovering your mind from a very busy and active life so that you are able to step back and make decisions which are not necessarily impacted by all the noise that you're going on, so you're not just sort of headlong diving into crisis you know, going into another crisis without really thinking about what you're doing. It reminds me of Jersey Gregory, um, you know, just being mindful of how you are doing what you're doing and where you're at in that moment. How do you think that plays into the recovery side of things, like the mindfulness? A lot of people talk about mindfulness and mind health and mental health. And if you're coming back to your point on Jersey, one of the things I got from the interview with Jersey is is um, is be present in in the moment. I find that quite difficult. It's something I constantly work on, and and it makes so much sense if you listen to him and have it explained. There's nobody that can say and that can disagree with him. The the power and the benefit of being mindful. Byron Katie, who we interviewed as well, very much talk, talked about that. It, it, it's I find it difficult because you. Um, as running a business, you've always got so many things to do, and not not that that's a good answer, but you, you're, um, you know, you can have a phone call, then you're doing a podcast, then you're with a customer, then you're with your children, and 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 if you're not careful, you can always in your mind you can be somewhere, so we can be sitting here together, but your mind is already thinking about something outside, and it, it you may think that it makes sense to be thinking about that, but you're never really present, you're never really giving your full intention on what you're doing. You're never really allowing the flow of information to come through you, and, and you're probably never really giving your best if you're not present. But it's quite difficult to do that. And, and I think with it, we've all seen it. We're in meetings, we're having a conversation, we're on our phone, we're sending texts, we've got emails coming in, we're on Facebook, we're on Instagram. We're, we're not really sitting there fully listening to someone. The, the, quality, the amount of quality time that we've got doing that is probably very, very short. Even though we think we're sitting there with our children for two hours, we're probably conscious and present for about 10 minutes when we're not on our phones or something. So I, I think certainly listening to, to Jersey and, and talking about being present and when you're in that moment, when you're with that person, when you're in that meeting, is you're just there, 100% present. Nothing else is going on in your mind. You're there, you're connected. And I think that's a very difficult thing to do from me personally, and certainly know a lot of people I meet that, that struggle with that as well. So going along with the conversation of mindset and mindfulness, let's talk about intent. So with the podcast, we had we had the intention of what? Well, originally there, there was there was there was a couple of uh, couple of intentions. The, the first one was that we I, I realized that I was traveling around a lot, meeting a lot of interesting people. And, and I felt that it was traveling to go and see someone was a big investment. It was a big investment for my time. It was an investment to travel itself. And a lot of times I was having some fantastic conversations about some really, really interesting subjects. And it's like, this would be great just to share this with other people. And outside of the small circle of people that were in that meeting, it was almost lost forever. So with the ability using technology, cameras and and filming equipment and the cost of that coming down quite significantly. I, 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 I thought, well, why don't we just film some of this stuff and share it with other people in the industry? Because 
up until recently, these conversations weren't really shared and it wasn't easy to, to really um, get different people's perspectives. It was very limited to a few different types of media. So you'd go to a trade show and you would every, certain people would come together and they would have the popular speakers that they would always invite back. So, so your view of the industry was based around the organizers of these events and the subject, the people that they wanted to put onto those events and their perspective of the industry. That was really it. And then you had a few magazines. And, and, and I guess our industry was very similar on a small scale to the media world in general, is, is you, you have people that control the information. They have an agenda. Most of those agendas are based around who's sponsoring them. And, and that's your view of the world. So what we wanted to do is, to, is, what I wanted to do is to kind of get an unbiased view. It's like, look, you know, I'm gonna, if it's an interesting story or if someone approaches us and it's interesting, it's different, then we wanted to really be able to, to, to tell and, and share those stories. And, and, and I think we've been able to, to, to do that. Um, I, I, I certainly realize that in general, you, you get an, a very narrow view of the world and you, you don't have time to explore things and, and, and explore information. And it's, you know, whether it's about, whether you read something in the newspapers about this diet is great or this way of exercising, it's great. Someone's behind that, someone's sponsoring it. I, I think with the, with the internet, you, you, you're starting to get a little bit more of an, an unbiased view. Although it, it's still controlled. If, if you look at what happens on Facebook, you know, once you start, if you go onto a website or arguably you speak into your phone that you're looking for paleo diet, suddenly all this stuff is gonna come at you. You're gonna get emails about paleo diets. You're gonna see things about animals. You, you, you know, that, that is gonna come back at you and, and you're gonna be surrounded by this information. And you're gonna think that that's your view of the world where really you're just being remarketed to. You're, you're, you're being kind of influenced based on something you're gonna look at. I think podcasts are slightly different because there's no in general, in a lot of them, there's no agenda. There's, there's, um, you know, we none of the people that come onto our podcast are paying us anything. We're attempting to be as uh, neutral as possible, and we, we're attempting to sort of highlight interesting information. And I think because of that, it allows us to really share what's what's actually happening in in the industry. It's it's fairly unfiltered. It's fairly unbiased, and um, and and it also helps, I guess, for people to make decisions which are not necessarily influenced by someone who's uh, going to make some money out of it. Now, I know we're a you know, escape of funding this and sponsoring this, and as an equipment, we're a, you know our our interest is to if people want to buy functional training equipment, then to come to us. So I suppose you can you know we're probably not totally unbiased, but we like to to think that. Um, you know, one of the things that we do is, is to be able to sort of spotlight interesting things that will help our customers and people that could potentially be our customers one day. So, so coming, long answer to your question, but that, that was our intention. Um, and I, and I, I think it still is. And as we've got into it a little bit more and started to realize more about this world and, of, of media, I, I, I think we're, we're even more passionate about sharing those stories. And, and we really, what we want to hear is, is we want to hear back from people that do have some ideas that are valid that we can check out and share those opportunities with other people as well. Yeah, absolutely. Hold that thought. By the way, this episode is brought to you by Escape Fitness. <laughs> check out escapefitness.com. <laughs> we don't do that and we haven't done that. Um, and, there, and there's been a, you know, we've been very sort of um, purposeful in that. And you know, we've, yeah. we, we, we have lots of discussions and debates within our company to say, well, look, you know, you're investing a, a lot of money in doing these podcasts. You know, you know yourself, it's not cheap to do this, to set this up. People's times, we travel a lot. We don't do podcasts over the phone like a lot of them. Uh, we do them live, we film them. It's a, it's a we aim to be a, a premium experience and it, and it does cost a lot of money. And so the argument is, well, why aren't we selling a lot more in it? Um, we may take on sponsorship to offset some of the costs, but we, we wanted to be very much independent and, and we wanted people to listen to us because they really felt that we were adding value, and um, we were generally helping the industry. Uh, and and if, if you know if Escape can do that and, and afford to do that, and and people can come to us 
as a result of that, then, then that's, that's a good thing. But we, we didn't want it primarily to be a, a, a sales pitch. And um, as I said, in, internally, we've had a lot of battles to whether we should make it a little bit more that. But I, I think um, for the moment, um, you know, we, we, we're not going to go down that direction. Right. Really just playing the long game. Yeah. And as, as Jersey said, I, I, and I'm glad you picked on it, up on it, but Jersey says easy decisions, hard life. Hard decisions, easy life. And it, you kind of have to let that settle in a bit and, and to really understand it and think on it and meditate on it. But it's, it's a great statement. And uh, um, Brian O'Rourke also mentioned this, that there's a, I can't remember exactly what the survey is, but there's a, there's a survey that measures trust global, globally. And he says trust amongst governments and companies is, a, is at an all-time low. And, um, and, and I think coming back to Jersey's point is, is it's very tempting when you have a, a monthly p l to be making decisions that are probably beneficial for the short term. It's, it, it, it's, not, it's not very easy. It's almost like you're forced into doing that. Um, when you're investing in something like a podcast or a marketing activity, it's very easy to sort of say, well, we've done it for three months and we're not seeing results. So let's cut that and try something else. And so I think a lot of businesses nowadays, and certainly this is the feedback that I, I get from a lot of people, is these are very short-term decisions, and 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 you have to, you, you can't ignore that. But it's also important, I think, to consider a long game. And and it it as, as Jersey said, you know, easy decisions, hard life, hard decisions, easy life. And sometimes you have to make hard decisions to invest in the long game, whether that's working out. You, you can apply that same philosophy. It's like easy decision. Well, the easy decision is to skip the workout. The easy decision is to eat something that you shouldn't eat. The easy decision is to kind of skip that healthy lifestyle. The hard decision is to refrain from those extra glasses of wine, refrain from that nice cake, you know, refrain from sitting on the couch instead of going out. And, and you can apply those, those things to business. But I think it, generally in life particularly nowadays, we want that instant gratification. We want, social media is instant gratification. You'll, you'll do a post and you get a ping. It's, it's geared around sort of working on your brain to reward you for those little things. And, and very few people are, are in it for the long game. Any, any fitness product, any diet product, it's all about getting rich quick, getting a quick diet. And, and we all know, anyone that's been in the industry, there is no quick results to getting fit. I, I've... I've been involved in this for 30 years. I've tried all different diets. I'm fairly proud that I'm in a decent shape at approaching 50. And there is no shortcut. It, it comes down to consistent hard work and, and a good diet and a, and a good balanced work routine. And, and, and I think business is, is the same. And so coming back to what, you know, what we're trying to do, and I, I guess what I get other businesses to think about, our lesson is, is to is over the long term, people will work out whether they can trust you or not. Um, when you're starting a business, you have to plan to be here over the long term. And, and I think when you're doing certain marketing activities, whether it's creating a podcast or, or whatever you're doing, is, is I think you've just got to have that real long term approach. And we're, we're in the second year of this. And we have, I think, when we last count, we've got about 150,000 um, listens on different platforms, which is, I'm pretty impressed with that, but it's, it's taken two years to get to that. And, um, and certainly for the first 12 to 18 months, you, you kind of have to question you know, how many people are actually listening to it. And, and you can't always measure that as well. You, you can't always measure what's actually happening because it's, it, it materializes itself in lots of different ways. Yeah. Um, so yeah, to come back to your point, I, I think you just, it's important now in this day and age to, to be open, authentic, for people to be able to understand what they're buying into, who you are as a brand, to tell that story. But, but it's not going to happen by getting the sort of social media hack, getting all these followers and to be able to sort of, you know, for people to suddenly think your business is the next best thing. It's, it's a slow burn. To your point too, especially for the long game, what really helps along is collaboration, like Mark Master I've talked about. Yeah, I, I love Mark's view on this and it's, it's not the common view, or it's certainly not spoken about a lot, but he, Mark's view is that 
the industry, there's, there's enough there for everybody. There's a huge amount of opportunity and possibility. And um, he's, his approach, as he referred to in the podcast, is he would invite people in, come and have a look at the business and come and see what we're doing and let's share ideas. His view is how you execute those ideas is the difference that makes a difference anyway. But he was very much about working and talking and sharing ideas. And I think as an industry, it's a very small industry in defining, the, I guess, the current fitness uh, space and, and health club space. It's a very small industry. A lot of people move around. And if you've been in it for long enough, you'll, you'll, you'll have met most people. Um, but I, I guess the, the, the collaboration probably isn't what it should be. I think, I think we all, and we've all been guilty of it, are all protective of our own part and, um, and don't want to share or collaborate for fear that we're going to lose something. But it's, it's, I, I guess it is a scarcity mentality. And I, I think in, when you do have those conversations, and I've certainly had them with potential competitors in a lot of cases, and some really interesting stuff comes out. We have quite interesting business relationships with a lot of people that you would think are competitors, but actually we have a collaboration. We make money, they make money. And you would think that we're, you know, we're, we're competitors, but, but getting around the table, having a conversation, which is what we've had to do in quite a few cases, you suddenly realize, oh, actually, you know, we can help you here and you can help us there. And we've both kind of grown this area. And so I, I think certainly we could, we could do a lot better at, about that. But I would encourage people, particularly if they're starting up a business and they're, they're on their own, you know, small player, small studio, small club, I would think about how they can collaborate with, with other people. Uh, Peter Marks, in his uh, podcast we had on a few weeks ago, he talked about the, he, he's in the nightclub business, and, and he talked about the importance of creating a, um, an, a, a live and thriving city center. So for him, if he had the latest and greatest nightclub, but he was the only one in the city center, then that's not good for him and his business. What he needs is thriving competition to attract people into that center. So he wants bars and clubs and restaurants and, and, and just to make it a place where people are prepared to go to. And, and the fitness industry is like that. If, if you think about it, what, what we need is we've got something that can make a difference to so many, different, so many people's lives. I don't know what the percentages are and people argue what statistics are, are true, but there's still a lot more people that could do with health and wellness than people are actually taking part in it. So there's a, there's a massive upside if we can get more people involved in the industry. So rather than thinking about fighting for market share, which is easy, easier said than done when you are competing as a business, but, but thinking about how we can collaborate and actually get more people into the space is going to be beneficial for us all in the end if we can successfully do that. So I think Mark's view on collaboration certainly worked for his business. And I think we can all do, we could all do a lot better job at thinking about going out for a beer with one of your competitors, having a chat or, or what you perceive as competitive and, and just asking the question, how could we, how could we grow this pie for everybody? Or bring them onto the podcast. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, yeah. <laughs> We've had a lot of guests that have been in this industry and a lot of really good lessons and a lot of really good points for entrepreneurs and, and, and self-starters in this industry. What lessons have you taken away from a lot of these guests that you've, you've started looking at applying to Escape as a brand? What, one of the things that certainly come across is that there's a lot of information to take in. Yeah. Um, a lot of different ideas and, and, and I think as, a, as an owner, a leader of a business or a team or, or, or what have you, it's, you, you've got to be able to decide, you've got to, you've got to decide where to go for your information. You've got to be able to decide what information is relevant for you and your business. But I, I think you've also got to make sure that you don't become sort of insular and, and, and don't lose touch with what's going out or going on in, in the market. One of the things I realized when I started doing this and, and, and actually coming to America was that how long I'd had my business. So I've been in business, this 
escaped now for 21 years, and it doesn't seem like a long time at all. But when you think about 21 years, that's, that's a long time. That's, a, that's a, a lifetime for a lot of the customers that buy equipment from us. You know, that, that. And so when you're in a company or what have you, you, if you're not careful, you can actually get old. You can become an old company um, in terms of, you know, if a company was a real person, they can age. And, and if you're not careful, you're losing touch with where a lot of your customers are. And, and so although I used to feel as though I was very in touch, I used to go to the trade shows and I used to talk to a lot of people. It was, it was amazing until I got out there that I realized, look, there's, there's all these other things going on. Now, that doesn't mean that you should um, necessarily lose touch with who your target audience is. As, as a company, you've got you to understand who, you, who your audience is and make sure you're doing a, a good job at servicing them. But, but, but people, your, your target customers also age and, and what they're interested in changes. And, and so I think it's, it, the, the challenge is, is to stay relevant with, with, with your, your customer. And, um, and so I think it, it's, it's, it, it's a difficult thing to solve, but I, I think in, in times like today where technology is changing and, and the way people purchase things are changing, there, there, there's so much change going on in the world that you, you have to either have a really good team around you that's feeding you some great information about what's happening out in the marketplace. You know, who's your customer? What do they want? What, what are they likely to want in a few years to, 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 to anticipate where they're going and, and to be able to feed that back into your business so you, so you stay relevant because there's so many businesses that we know or hear about or are in the industry that have definitely lost touch with their customer. They're definitely getting old. They're definitely becoming irrelevant. And in a lot of cases, they're stuck to a business model that's going to be very, very difficult to move away from. And, 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 it, and it's something that if you do leave it too late, it, it, it can be almost like a, a, a huge change to, to readjust and, and, and to get on course with who the target customers are. So, so I, think, I think it's really important, um, and what I've learned from this, is, is, to, is to just make sure that you're getting out, talking to people, customers, industry, and not necessarily just in our industry, but in other industries to see what's going on in the business world and, and, to, and to have some, sort of, some form of strategy to do that. And you don't have to do it yourself. For me in my business, that's, that's my job and that's what I do. But there's, you can have and, and take on people or have people in your team that, that does that. But I think you've got to really be in touch with what's going on and you've got to be able to have some sort of planned innovation to be able to bring that back into your business and, and to make sure that you're not so far ahead of the curve that you're innovating something that's probably going to take you a long time to, to, to be able to realize. But you're innovating just, just ahead of the curve enough so you can, you can remain relevant. And the, and the reason I mention that is because we have a lot of discussions about innovation. And innovation is expensive in itself. But, but trying to um, explain to the, the end customer, the need for that innovation is also highly expensive. So if, if you're a big company, you can afford to educate and, and, uh, and, and market, put, your, put your marketing plans together to, to show people or to educate people why that product's needed. But if you're a small business and you've got this great idea, this great technology, this great way of working out, then you've got to, you've got to make sure that if, if it is totally revolutionary, that you can actually afford to, to show people why they need it. And, and if you're not careful, if, you, if you're too far ahead of the curve, then you'll have this great idea, but nobody will want to come and buy it from you, that new concept, because you're just too far ahead. And you either have to do two things. You have to be able to wait it out until somebody else trains and educates people about the need, and then you can ride off the back of it. Um, or you have to do it yourself and be prepared to invest a lot of money before people are prepared to come on. So, so I think... You know, a long answer to the question, but two things. I think one, you need to be in touch with what's going on in the market, and not just in our industry, but in other industries, and make sure you or someone's got got a strategy to 
to, to be able to sort of navigate where things are going and anticipate what people are likely to want to do, where they're going, where they're spending their time, where they're consuming information and their, and their habits and their lifestyle. And then two, make sure that you are innovating because all businesses need to innovate, but that innovation is, is controlled. And, and if you're a small company, you're tapping into something that somebody else has already created like a big company and you're just riding on the back of that education. Or if you're big and brave and you can create a category that you have got the ability to educate the market so that people are gonna buy that product. And then also you've got it protected enough so that you know, you're gonna be the um, preferred supplier for that category and you're not gonna lose it to someone else because you've not had good protection, if that makes sense. Got it, so you're either, you're either the innovator with the deep pockets, who's willing to throw the money at it, to do the education, to push the product as far as possible to get everybody up to speed to why they need to have it, or you ride it out and let other people do the education side, build up the need for it, and then you're you're pushing your product along with it. Yeah, so let's take this, this category that I'm passionate about, even though I've not got any interest and we don't have any products in this category yet, but recovery. So recovery, we all know this is going to be something that's, that's going to be big in the next few years. We know that. You're going to see studios with big recovery, standalone studios. You're going to see it part of fitness clubs. This is going to be popular. You're going to see it in corporate. Um, that, that's a category that's going to be developed. Now, the, the, the challenge is that outside of developed markets, a lot of people are not even thinking about this yet. Right. So, so how, you know, where, where, did, where do you... Mr. or Mrs. Businessman or woman stand on this. Probably what, what makes sense is to, if, if you're a small company, is to be mindful and aware of that's coming and, and prepare yourself in a way where the risk is fairly limited, but prepare yourself for when this will hit and make sure that you're one of the fast followers to get in there, to get in there early. You, you've done the research, you've found the products, you've found the models, you've got the people. Um, and whether it's next year or the year after, you're ready for when that comes to your town or city or state or, or, or what have you. Or you can be bullish and you can say, I'm gonna open 100 of these studios and I'm, I'm, gonna, I'm gonna sort of invest in sh explaining to people and doing the whole PR and media and, and convince the town, the city, the state, the country that this is a category to be involved in. And, um, or you kind of collaborate with a bunch of different people that, that are gonna collectively promote that category and make sure that you're, that's where the collaboration, you know, make sure you're part of it. But someone, if, it, if, if it's known in the industry, that doesn't necessarily mean that Mr. and Mrs. Smith and my mom and dad get that they need to be doing recovery and paying 20 or $30 a pounds to go to a studio for it. it so it, it's, it's really, it, it's making sure that you're, a, you're the right side of the timeline or, or the dynamics are, are working. We've done that as a company a number of times. We've come out with these great products and We've been seven, eight, nine, ten years too soon, and fortunately, we've waited for certain products, um, like the deck, for example. We, you know, we were involved in that product about ten years before it really wow. picked up. You know, it was, it was a very simple product, nothing great about it. But when we were selling that product, um, we were going in England at the time, and we were knocking on doors of club owners, and we were saying, "Look, we've got this great new product for the studio," and they were saying, "Well, look, we're fine with steps. You know, the step does what we want. We we don't need this kind of." other thing, this bench idea, and, and we didn't sell it. And we went to shows for years and years and years and, and the sales were just average. And then suddenly HIT came along and suddenly people in their studios and aerobics rooms wanted to do a different type of training. And then suddenly this was the, the perfect product for people to, to, to put in their studios. It did way more than the step. We obviously saw that many years ago, as did part of the people that developed the product. But we were, we were too early and we, we, we weren't big enough to create that category. It was something that fortunately happened within the industry and it, and it made it popular. So, so that's, a, that's an example of, of strategic innovation, but also understanding the importance of timing and where you sit and how that relates to you in, in the market that you're, you're uh, serving. For those of you guys who don't know, Matthew just had his 49th birthday. So we're, we're already kind of secretly planning his 50th birthday. It's gonna be the biggest thing on the planet. It's probably gonna be <laughs> a live event. We're gonna have a DJ, the works, like balloons, party streamers, the works. Uh, 
And time and time again, I overhear the guest saying, wow, you're in amazing shape. And when they find out how old he is, they're like, wow, I want to be like you when I'm 50. Or there, there will be guests who are about the same age and they're like, Matthew is in incredible shape. And they talk about his abs and his, his guns and all that stuff. And then when he does his Facebook or Instagram post with him shirtless, working out with different pieces of equipment, <laughs> glimmering and just showing everything off, people are just mighty impressed. And, and I think Matthew's kind of coined this term of the corporate athlete. And I think it's, it's, it's created a new way of thinking about uh, what athleticism is, or even in the corporate space, what being fit is, right? Yeah, absolutely. Um, thank you, Kevin. You're making me blush and uh, <laughs> keep it coming. But, but no, I, I, I guess for me, fitness has been important since I've been 15 and, and, um, and, and it's been a key part of my life for a number of different reasons. And, and, uh, and like we said earlier, there, there's no shortcut. It, it's something that I've done for many, many years now. And, uh, and it takes constant work and I'm, I'm constantly putting my my zone belt on and trying to compete with people younger than myself, including my younger brother, who I, I like to say I, um, I beat on our my zone challenge earlier, earlier this year. But yeah, one, to, to, to answer your point, one of the things that came apparent to me, several guests that we spoke to, including Jay Wright, who, who talked about this a lot, and he, I guess, framed it quite nicely. He, Jay Wright has a fantastic business and he puts in corporate wellness facilities for huge big banks and big firms with, with people that are responsible for thousands of employees and a huge amount of money. He, he referenced the hedge funds that he works with and on a daily basis these guys are moving millions and millions of dollars around the world. And so if they're not in absolute tip-top shape mentally and physically then just the wrong decision at the wrong time can have disastrous consequences, um, and 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 you could you could argue that about many people. You know, if you're if you're responsible for a big team of people, then if you come in and your your things your your life's not great, you're not in great shape, or you just you know what it's like when you if you don't feel well, if you're tired and run down and you're not working out and you've not had great food, then just when you come into a meeting, you're not, you're not focused, you're not thinking. So sometimes the react, the, you, you can just react to a decision and if you add a number of those decisions up over a few days or weeks, then you, you're going in a very different direction. So what I started to realize is, is the importance of becoming a, what, what we term now as, as, as a corporate athlete. And, and so thinking of yourself, if you're in business, manager, supervisor, owner, CEO, MD, VP, whatever it is, you're, you're in the world of business. And, and, and you, you need to be thinking about yourselves as an athlete because if, a, a, an, I think- um, Jason Perugia. Yeah, Jason re referenced this and, um, and, he, and even um, uh, Jay references. But if, if you're in the a NBA, and I can't remember that, I, I don't know too much about the NBA or the NFL, and he mentioned the amount of time the a, a world class player is actually on court or on the on the pitch playing and it, and it's a relatively small amount of time and and the amount of training that they do for that short amount of time is incredible so they a, a huge amount of time is 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 training conditioning diet sleep mental training Every, there's a, there's a huge amount of work that goes for those few hours on, on the pitch or on the court if you think about someone in the business world, then we're pretty much 50 weeks a year, eight to 12 hours a day, maybe more for some, in some cases, we're on, we're, we're performing. And yet, how much of that time are we practicing, training, rebuilding ourselves, recovering, thinking about our diet, our nutrition? How much of our time are we in order to be a great corporate athlete? And, and the, the truth is, in most cases, we're not, we're not getting enough sleep we're not eating the right food. We're not getting the right training. We're not taking the right breaks. We're not working on our mindset. In, in most cases, we're, we're, we're not a, a very, very well engineered and oiled athlete. And, and so I, I think it's 
one of the things that we've been talking about a lot is, is how, what, what you need to do. How you, first, first of all, I like to think of myself as, a, as an athlete because I think it, it frames things in a slightly different way. Yep. You know, you, you're not grinding it out, which the, one of the, the terms people talk about is this you know, work hard, grinding out. It, it, it sounds quite painful and it sounds like, you know, don't, don't get any rest, you know, kind of work long hours, work weekends, grind, grind, grind. That, that's, that's what you pick up from social media at the moment. And, and for me, I think, why don't you look at a, a world-class athlete, whether it's a UFC fighter, an NBA player, a professional football player, whatever, and look at what they're doing for themselves, uh, for their mind, their body, their sport, and, and then see about how you can apply some of those things to your working life and, and you know, sort of see how that impacts you, see if you could see if you can become better. And, and um, I think that's one of the things I'm going to try and do. And, and probably the biggest thing out of all of that is as well as the, the, the diet and nutrition is, is that sort of rest time, that downtime, is having some, time, some clear space and thinking space where you're actually prepared, you're gathering your thoughts, you're collecting your ideas before you go into that situation. Because I think if, if, if you can do anything that will help you think clearly, make better decisions, then your business is going to be better and the people that work for you are going to be better and you know, it's going to be a better place, I guess. Absolutely. On that, you know, we talk about the corporate athlete and we talk about the mindset of an athlete. And then, you know, it's, it's, hard, to, it's hard to talk about that and not think about competition and, and comparisons. Yeah. Like, especially with social media, it's so easy for us to get caught up comparing ourselves to others who are either at the same level or doing better. It's, it's a lot of that uh, constant questioning, are you doing the right thing? And, and listening to, especially the comments. Sometimes, you know, that's, some, that's the first rule of the internet is just don't look at the comments, but it's hard to do that. It's hard to not avoid, it's hard to avoid the, the comments and, and the criticisms and then not let that get to you. There's a number of things that um, I want to sort of speak to. I, I think I think the first thing is you, you've got to be you've got to be careful about listening to other people's opinions because in a lot of cases it holds you back. You know, it's certainly something for me. I read the comments a lot of cases. You know, I've, I'm not great at this. I'm learning every single day. And you read the comments and it's and, and you sort of question yourself and hey, is is it making a difference? Are you good enough? Should you be doing this? And and so you really have got to be careful because if 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 you allow that to uh, totally impact you and influence you, then you're not going to do anything. You're you're just going to be stuck in your own kind of prison, never trying any new ideas because you're always sort of afraid of what other people are saying. I know Cali Muscle we interviewed. He he very much said that you know don't don't listen to what other people say. You know if if you get any negative feedback. Use it to fuel you and drive you and to make you better. But, but try and avoid letting those things get you down. And that could be a small thing from someone in your workplace that sort of thinks you've got a bad idea to somebody on social media. So I, I, think, I think that's one of the first things. I think the second thing, a, a good friend of mine who has a, a, a successful business um, in the sort of restaurant world, he, he talks about it. You know, he's, he... We, we had a conversation recently and you, 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 we had a conversation about different people's social media platforms. And, and on social media, everybody thinks everybody's fantastically successful. And um, you're, when, when you look at it yourself, you think, well, why aren't I as successful as them? Or you, you, you compare yourself to others. And, um, and in a lot of cases, whether, whether it's you compare yourself physically to others, so you're looking at someone else who's 50 and say, well, he's better than why, why, why are I like that? Or um, you compare their business to others or you compare their relationship to others. So you're, in, in a lot of cases, you're comparing yourself to other things and other people. And I think that's just the world we live in. It's, there's there's so, many, so much information out there and everybody's showing the best versions of themselves that if w- when you're in a role or a career or a business you and if it's not going well you you can quite easily create a, a, you know create a sort of a negative spiral in your own mind to say well I'm not where I should be or I'm not where other people should be and and that can almost set you back mentally and and I think 
most people I've spoke to that have this sort of external persona of being very, very successful, when you talk to them, that's just a, a moment in time. That's a, that's a split second, and, and that's the, the part of the story that they're telling. And there's nothing wrong with that, but mo most of the people, that, or near all of the people that we've met in our podcast, so they go through ups and downs. You know, sometimes their business is great, sometimes their career is great, but a lot of times it's not. A lot of times they're having to deal with huge or overcome huge barriers. Their businesses are having huge issues. They're dealing with struggles of balancing their life and their families and their children and their employees. And, and when you sort of time the majority of their, of, of their career or their working life, the, probably a larger percentage of it is dealing with issues and challenges compared to the small celebration that you happen to see on, on social media. So I think the important thing that I've realized, and, I, and I've done this, I've seen a lot of my friends and you, you look and you see what they're doing and, or other business colleagues and you think, wow, they're, they're doing fantastic. When you sit down and have a conversation with them, you find that it's not like that and, and things are real and, and just the same as you see someone who's suddenly got the six pack and you think, wow, how, they, how quickly that they've got that six pack. They don't realize that, it, that they've been working on it for two or three years and they've been great diet, great workouts and it's not just happened. And, and, and the same applies to business. And, and if you're starting out, I, I think you just gotta be careful um, not to suddenly think that you're not doing as well as you should do. And that's where this collaboration comes about. And, and that's where the sharing and, and, and discussion with people, because, because we all live in a real world. And I, and, and I, I think it's important for, for our own mental health to just, just to have an element of reality and not to put yourself under a huge amount of stress um, in work, in your relationships and with people because you fear you're not doing well enough and, and, and that you, you, you know, all you can do is as good as what you can do. And, um, and there's gonna be good days and there's gonna be bad days. And as, as we talked about earlier, you know, focus on the job in hand. You know, don't go into work sitting in front of somebody in a meeting thinking about something else because that isn't gonna help either. You know, you gotta, you gotta be present, you gotta be real and, and, you've, and you gotta accept that businesses go up and down. And, and, um, and, and I think if you can do that, then the, the, as Byron Katie says, you, you're, you're not just gonna have a strong and flexible body to deal with anything life throws at you, but you're gonna have a strong and flexible mind to deal with what life throws at you. And, and, and unfortunately, or fortunately that you know, no matter how great your body is, unless your mind is strong and flexible and rational and, um, and able to deal with everything life throws at it, then you know, everything else is gonna go to pieces. Your business will go to pieces, your, your, your body will go to pieces, your relationship. So, so it's just really important to kind of focus on that mental health, however you do it, and, and not burn yourself out. Because I know for myself, certainly when I'm run down and tired and, and burnt out, that I'm not, I, you know, I'm not my best and, and I've learned as I've got older, to just take those extra few days and, and to rest and recover and to be fully charged and then go back at it. And I can hit it hard as opposed to sort of trying to go straight, although I still, <laughs> still do it sometimes, but you know, go straight off the plane into a meeting and, and end up you know, sort of burning yourself out and having a sore throat like I've got at the moment for, for a while. So, so to, uh, to answer a, a, a long answer to, um, to your question, I, I, I think it's just really, really important to sort of balance what you see out in the world in social media and just put an element of, of reality onto that and, and not get fooled by um, what, what you think someone else is doing and, and, and just focus on what you're doing to the best of your ability. What are you looking forward to this coming year? Well, this is, a, this is an exciting year on a number of levels. It's, it's going to be the year I'm 50. So uh, we all... <laughs> Telling you, it's going to be live streamed. It's going to be the biggest party this planet, this this area has ever seen. Yeah, and you know, you know, whatever whatever you plan, things life always sort of throws curveballs in, and you've got to you've got to be prepared to move around it. But certainly, certainly, my plan is uh, I want to sort of make sure I'm in good shape for my 50th birthday. That's in that's important to me. So I'm going to be um, I'm going to be sort of looking at improving my rest, recovery, flexibility strength conditioning so so personally I, I just want to make sure i'm sort of in a in a good place i'm, I'm cutting down on my alcohol I, I do like a good 
glass of wine, um, but I've, I've sort of, probably in the last 12 months, I've been actively cutting that back down. Not that I drink a crazy amount, but I just feel better when I'm not doing it. I sleep better, I wake up earlier in the morning. Uh, so, so as boring as that sounds, and I didn't ever think I'd, I'd do that, but just, um, yeah, just, just sort of getting my own sort of personal self um, in a good shape and, and inspiring people on, the, on that journey as well. From a business perspective, we've got a bunch of really exciting stuff uh, that's, that's coming down. I, I think uh, one, of the, one, of the, one of the areas in the industry I've noticed isn't as good as what it, what it should be is just the general awareness and education levels from, from people. I, I think when I came into the industry, there was, uh, there was a, lot of, a lot of investment in training and education. And, and I think with just the state of the market at the moment, I think uh, that's probably suffered. And, and the volume of quality people probably isn't what it should be. And so what we're, what we're trying to do is we, we, we're creating a number of digital products so both helping the, the consumer that comes into facilities to understand how to use the functional training tools. And if you think about what's happened in the industry over the last five to 10 years is years ago, people would go on machines, whether it's strength machines or cardio machines, and, and the machines would sort of guide them through workouts and show them what to do. Nowadays, we have all these great tools from bags and balls and ropes and bands and everything. But when my mom and dad go in there, they don't know how to use this equipment. And, and what's worse, if they enter in that space, they don't want to feel stupid about picking it up and using it in the wrong way or picking it up on the wrong side or just feeling uncomfortable because these spaces are generally in the middle of facilities and everybody's looking at them. So they want to go in there and feel confident and empowered and be able to do something with the equipment. And, and I think just the ability to, to guide people through basic exercises has gone in a, in a lot of spaces. You know, There's not as many trainers in there for for different reasons and, and people are not getting instructed. So one of the things that we've put a big investment is, is a lot of digital instruction. So whether that's, um, we, we're partnering up with MyZone so you can have all of our, we've got a couple of thousand exercises that you can see on, on the MyZone screen. So you can have guided uh, workout classes. We have our Mars system. So you've got a touch screen TV where people can go in there and they can pick a product or a workout and just understand the basics on how they can use a piece of equipment. And hopefully that's an opportunity for, for trainers to go and engage with them as well. You know, if, if, if a trainer's standing there and seeing all these people going over to that screen trying to work things out, then it's an opportunity to go and have a conversation to say, look, you know, do you want me to take you to the next level? Or do you want me to help you improve that kettlebell swing? So, so the digital education is really important um, for us and it's something that we're, we're hopefully helping a lot of clients with. Uh, we're, doing some, um, we're doing some sort of like a unbranded content as well, where they can put it into their existing systems. And then the second, second area is we're kind of going back to our roots. When we started our company uh, 21 years ago, one of the first products that we developed was a Olympic disc and a, and a dumbbell. That's really how Escape started. And uh, we've, we've, we've kind of stayed true to that functional movement in, in the whole of our lifespan. But one of the things that we've been doing this year in 2019 is we developed a whole new range of free weights and weight plates um, and storage to go with it. So we, we're, we're really excited. It's a great product. I love launching great products and we've had some really uh, good people on, on the team developing it. And it, it, you know, we hope, we, we, we think it's gonna be one of, the, one of the great products on the market in that sort of free weight uh, category. So we're, we're very excited to launch that product this year. Uh, that's, that's another big thing for us. And then we've got a bunch of other things that will be coming out. We've, uh, we've just built up our product team, so we've got some really new and talented people in there. And uh, as, as a company, we just always like sort of um, giving people new and exciting ways to work out and, and then showing them how, how to do that. So, so for next year, I'm, I'm gonna be um, just, just really focused on telling more people about what we're doing and how they can, uh, how they can work out. But again, not just, not just from Escape. You don't have to buy things from Escape. We hope that people would, but, but just hopefully more people can get into the space and um, just, you know, sort of, I guess, benefit from the, the benefits that I've had from, from being in this, in this industry over sort of 21 plus years, really. Nice. <laughs> so that's been an awesome 2019. It's been exciting. It's been a lot. We've just, we've been all over the place and doing a lot and just working with 
a lot of the other team members from Escape, I can definitely see that 2020 is going to be a big year. So thank you for that. Thank you to you guys for watching and being a part of this whole adventure. And I think that's it for 2019. Thanks, Kevin, and, th and thanks for doing all the magic, uh, both Kevin and Dom, to be fair, yeah. doing the magic behind the camera. And there's and, and Wendy and Liz and Ben. We've got a great team that helped put these together. And, and if you've got any ideas, any feedback, if there's things that you like, if there's things you don't like, if there's guests that we should be interviewing, we'd love to hear from you and uh, to make this a, a, a valuable resource for, for the industry and the people that we work with. So again, thank you and uh, have an awesome 2020. Hey, I hope you enjoyed this podcast. If you did, then please go over to iTunes and subscribe to the Escape Your Limits podcast. Leave a review, leave a comment. It really would help us a lot to continue to keep these going.